So let's talk about class N. Graphing polynomial functions and even slash on functions. All right. So a line is the graph of a polynomial of degree one. And there's actually a tiny bit more to say here. Uh, let me let Alessandra in. Um, so some examples of this would be like f of x equal to x, y equal to 2x minus 3, g of x equal to, um, I don't know, 6x, stuff like that. So these all are degree one polynomials. And we say they're degree one because, well, they are linear. But more importantly, the highest power of x is 1. And all the other powers of x are non-negative integers. So you can't have any fractional powers. You can't have any, um, there's another word I'm looking for. You can't have any negative powers. Yeah, that's a little bit, sorry, I'm trying to make the lighting here look a tiny bit less terrible. Um, there is one exception that I should mention. And that is if you have a horizontal line, I would still say that that's something linear, but it's technically not a degree one. So just off to the side here, just so everybody knows, a horizontal line is a zeroth degree polynomial. So it's a degree zero polynomial. It is still a polynomial. Um, so like, for example, f of x equal to 5, or y equal to negative 7, or g of x equal to pi. These are all horizontal lines. Y equal to five, Y equal to negative seven, Y equal to pi, right? All of the horizontal lines, all of them have degree zero. So don't worry too much about this, but I just want to mention normally a straight line with a non-zero slope is a first degree polynomial, but a straight line with a horizontal slope of, or a slope of zero is in fact degree zero. Okay, so lines, degree one, Quadratics or parabolas, degree two. So a parabola is the graph of a second degree polynomial, also known as a quadratic. We've seen plenty of examples of this. Um, our favorite example, f of x equal to x squared, but there's lots of examples, right? You could have y equal to, I don't know, negative 2x squared plus x plus 3. You could have g of x equal to x minus 2 squared plus 5. All kinds of things. You can even write it in out of order. You can write h of x equals 6 plus 5x plus x squared. Right? All of these are examples of secondary polynomials because all of the powers of x are non-negative integers and the highest power is two. Highest power is two, highest power is two. I've also got a power of one. You can also see you have a power of zero, although we don't usually make that distinction. Here also, if you multiply it out, which I'm not gonna do, but if you multiply it out, the highest power of x would be x to the second power. Same deal here, highest power of x is x to the second and all the other powers are non-negative integers. Um, and the list goes on, right? We could say that uh, a cubic function, right, the one that I'm terrible at drawing, like y equals x to the third or y equals x cubed, is a polynomial of degree three. Examples of this, y equal to x cubed plus 5x squared minus 6x plus 2. Or you could have something like y equal to x minus 2 cubed plus 1. Right, definitely a cubic because we're just shifting it to the right and one up, but it's still a third degree polynomial. Or right, you could have other things like f of x equal to x minus 2 times x plus 5 squared. 
This one, it's a little less obvious that it's cubic, but if you multiply it out, we're not gonna multiply it out, but if you multiply it out, the highest power of x would be x to the third. Um, yeah. So, and then as your powers get higher, you say like a fourth degree polynomial, we don't usually name them, but you could say a fourth degree polynomial is called a quartic, a fifth degree polynomial is called a quintic, or you can just say it's a fifth degree polynomial, it's a sixth degree polynomial. So usually once you get past like these first three word, few, first few words of linear, quadratic, and cubic, after that we kind of stop being so namey. That's that, that I can't say they're like, we don't really care so much about the names of the type of polynomial. We just say, oh yeah, it's a third degree polynomial, or it's a fifth degree, or whatever the degree is, whatever the highest power of x is, that's the degree of the polynomial. And the degree does tell us something important. Um, I should also point out, yeah, in these examples, I also want to mention the leading coefficients for just a sec. So the leading coefficient is the coefficient of x on the highest power of x. So, or the coefficient on the highest power. So here, the leading coefficient would be one. Here, the leading coefficient would be negative two. Here, the leading coefficient, if I multiplied this out, I would get x squared minus four x plus four plus five. The coefficient of x squared is one. Here, the leading coefficient is one because the coefficient of x squared is one. So it doesn't matter what the order is, we're always looking at the coefficient of the highest power of x in your polynomial. Okay, so why this is important? Well, it helps us know what the polynomial is gonna look like. So the degree combined with the leading coefficient, which I often abbreviate as LC, coefficient, um, Tell us about the end behavior of the graph. Meaning what's happening as we go way out to the left or way out to the right. There's a helpful chart that I usually like to draw. I'll grab some water here. So here's the chart. So you've got two choices for the leading coefficient and two choices for the degree. So the degree, we have that it's either even or odd. For the leading coefficient, we have that it's either positive or negative. So if the degree is even and the leading coefficient is positive, I like to think of something like y equal to x squared. So it kind of looks like this. Now maybe some crazy stuff happens in the middle, but what I really care about is that on the left it's going up and on the right it's going up. So you can either say, um, I mean, I really just, I really just draw something like this. I'm like, okay, it's up on the left, it's up on the right. And then in the middle, maybe something weird happens. Like for example, well, no, we'll draw some examples in here. On the other hand, if the lean coefficient is positive and the degree is odd, like y equals x cubed, which looks like this, right? It's down on the left and up on the right. If the degree is even and the leading coefficient is negative, that's kind of like having y equal to negative x squared, down on the left, down on the right. And then finally, if it's a leading coefficient that's, sorry, a degree that's odd and leading coefficient that's negative, it's going to be like negative x cubed, which is gonna flip it over and you're gonna get something like this. So it's up on the left and down on the right. Couple things I keep in mind. If the degree is even, both sides do the same thing. So if it's even, they're both up or both down. If it's odd, they're opposite. And then if the leading coefficient's positive, it's always going to be up on the right. Up on the right, up on the right. If the leading coefficient's negative, it's always gonna be down on the right. Those are the things I keep in mind. Um, there are more ways to say this. So if you look at, if you actually look at the notes that are posted here, which I don't want to write down all these things, so it's going to get messy. Let me just share my screen for one second. If you look at the notes, you'll see here that you can also say that, right, for the positive leading coefficient, even degree case, you can say it starts high, ends high, or you can say it starts in quadrant two. And you think about 
you think about actually graphing a thing, we have quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. I know it's hard to see that with me sharing my screen, but you hopefully know where the quadrants are. So for an even degree and a positive link coefficient, it starts in quadrant two, if we're going left to right, and ends in quadrant one. So high, high. Where, where as if it's a positive leading coefficient and odd, it's going to start low and end high or start in quadrant three and end in quadrant one. And the same sort of things for if it's negative, right? If the negative leading coefficient even, it's gonna be low, low or start in quadrant three and end in quadrant four. If it's a negative leading coefficient and a odd degree, it's gonna start high and low or start in quadrant two and in quadrant four. We might cross into other quadrants but if we're going left to right, the starting and ending are always what we know. Okay, so let's go on to doing lots of examples. Oh, I should also mention, so there is, um, if you look at, let me actually just show you, I should share, when you keep sharing my screen for a minute. So if you look at the notes, you'll see that there is this um, kind of template of all the things we kind of run through to graph a polynomial. So we look at the degree, whether it's odd or even, leading coefficient, and then the end behavior based on those two things. We find the y-intercepts, we find the x-intercepts, and we classify them. I don't usually use the number line, but you can, and then we do the graph. Um, what I want to say is that if you look at the module for this class n, gosh, there's always so many things in the way up here. So if you look at the module for class n here, you'll see that the polynomial, the graphing a polynomial template is available. So if you want to use that, or at least look at it when you're graphing polynomials, it is certainly there and available for you to use if it ever loads. Um, maybe it'll load someday, but basically it's the thing I just showed you. Like I really actually wanted it to load so you guys could see that it's there. Anyway, there it is. You can see it right there. So right, degree, highest power, leading coefficient, if it's positive or negative, y-intercept, and it actually says what to do, right? Set x equal to zero, solve for y. X-intercept, set y equal to zero, solve for x. And then we'll talk about classifying the x-intercepts um, shortly here. All right, back to the class. So let's do this example. Let me um, stop sharing the screen. I will also mention Desmos is a thing. You are allowed to look at Desmos. I would really, really encourage you to try graphing things before you look at Desmos. But then if you're like, I'm not sure if I really graphed that right, look at the graph on Desmos and see if your graph looks right. Do try to do it first on your own because you're gonna learn more if you actually try to do it on your own versus just looking at the answer. I mean, that's generally pretty true, so. All right, so we're trying to graph f of x equal to x squared times 3 minus x, which you could multiply out. If I distribute the x squared, we get f of x equal to 3x squared minus x cubed. Um, usually the factor form is better for finding most of the things we want to find, but the unfactor form is really great for seeing what the degree is. So my degree here, is three. We probably could have seen that without multiplying out, right? We can say, oh, like, look, if I did multiply this out, I know I'm getting an x squared times an x, which is going to give me an x cubed. My leading coefficient is negative because x cubed has a negative one as its coefficient. I don't really care what the value is. I just care whether it's positive or negative. So these two things together tell me that we're going to be going, well, it's an odd, odd degree, so opposite. And it's negative leading coefficient, so it's down on the right. So it's going to be up on the left, down on the right. All right, let's find the, all the other things. So to find the y-intercept, we're going to set x equal to 0. So x equals 0. y is going to equal 0 times 3 is 0. And move this chair. x-intercept, going to set y equal to 0. So setting the function equal to zero. So especially if you're finding the x-intercepts, it's really, really preferably to use the factored form. And then generally when we're finding the x things, which we'll talk more about when we talk about rational functions, 
The factory form is good for X things. The unfactory form is usually better for the Y things. Um, so X intercept, Y equals zero. So zero equals X squared times three minus X. So we set each factor equal to zero. X squared equal to zero gives me X equal to zero. Three minus X equal to zero gives me X equal to three. Those are my intercepts. <coughs> And we'll talk about classifying them in a minute. I'm going to skip that part for now. Um, usually, I don't do the number line because I don't think we need it. Well, let's do it in this case. So the number line, on the number line, you're going to put all of your x-intercepts. And then you're going to ask yourself, is the function positive or negative using these parts? Well, we actually know a couple of things. We know that because of the, 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 the end behavior, we know that furthest to the left, it has to be going up, meaning it has to be positive. Furthest to the right, it has to be going down. It has to be negative. You can also test points. You could say, I'm going to pick something bigger than three, like four. Four squared is positive. Three minus four is negative. A positive times a negative is negative. You just write it right there. And then you can pick something less than zero, like negative one. Negative one squared is positive. Three minus negative one is also positive. So it's a positive times positive. And then we can test something between zero and three, like one. One squared is positive, three minus one is positive. So our graph is going to be above the x-axis. It's going to touch the x-axis, still be above, come back and touch three, and then be below. So we're going to do something like this. That's what our graph is going to kind of look like. So when determining if the leading coefficient is negative or positive, we look at the no, it's not the second term destiny necessarily. It could be. It's always the coefficient on the highest power of x. So if I rewrote this in the standard way, which is negative x cubed plus 3x squared, we'd still be looking at the x cubed term. It's just that we say, it does, so it's not the order of things. It's the what's the highest power of x? What's the coefficient of that? In this case, the negative one. Yeah, good question, though. It's really important to clarify that. Um, so if I was graphing this, on my graph, I would plot the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts. The y-intercept is zero, so it's the same as the x-intercept. And then I'd say, okay, I know it's positive over here. I mean, it's really just going to look like that. It's positive over here. I hit this, and then I come back, and I, it's still quite positive, positive, and I hit this, and then negative. And my end behavior works, right? It's going up to the left, down to the right. Okay. Here's the thing, when you're classifying the x-intercepts, one of two things can happen. You can either have an x-intercept where the graph bounces, right, it stays on the same side of the x-axis, or you can have an x-intercept where the graph crosses. And this is directly correlated to whether the power of x is even or odd. Meaning, for this x-intercept, x equal to zero, it came from setting x squared with an even power equal to zero. You might, if it helps a little bit, you might rewrite this as x minus zero squared. So the factor that this intercept came from was this factor, it was to an even power. When the power is even, so, or when the multiplicity is another word we use for this, when the multiplicity is even, we bounce. There's a, there's a kind of, I feel like it's an old song now that was bounce, we bounce. Anyway, it's the song of my day, maybe not of your day. Um, you guys are like, what is this crazy old man talking about? I know. On the other hand, the three minus X here that the X equals three came from is raised to an odd power. If there isn't a power in there, the power is one. And an odd power means that we're going to have a multiplicity that is odd meaning we're going to cross or go through, as people like to say. So here we bounced, here we crossed. To me, this is a better, no, maybe not better, but I find this easier to do than having to do this number line thing where I'm plugging in numbers and testing points. So I usually kind of skip this and just look at classifying the x-intercepts and the end behavior. Let's look at some more examples.
But this is kind of the gist, right? Each of these polynomials, we're going to try and kind of graph using this methodology. So let's look at the next one. Um, f of x equal to x times x plus 2 times x minus 4 squared. All right. Um, let's do all the things. So what's the degree? Now, what is the degree? If we multiply this out, what would the highest power of x be? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What is it? Would it be 4? It would be 4. So typically, the way I kind of look at it is I'm just saying, well, here is an x times an x times an x squared. x times x times x squared is going to be x to the fourth. So basically just kind of seeing how many x's you can multiply together and get the biggest x. Um, also, in that calculation, we notice that when you do x times x times x squared, you do get a positive x to the fourth. So even though I haven't multiplied it out, I can see that my leading coefficient is positive. You could actually multiply it out. I don't want you to multiply it out if you don't have to. But if we multiply it out, right, this times this is x squared plus 2x. Right, that's the first two pieces. And x minus 4 squared is x squared minus 8x plus 16. And then you can probably see, I don't think I'm going to multiply that last part. It's in the notes if you want to see it in the notes that x squared times x squared will give me x to the fourth, and it will be positive x to the fourth. So these two things together tell me that my end behavior is up on the left and up on the right, or starts in Q2, quadrant two, ends in quadrant one. All right, let's um, find the intercepts, the y-intercept. A lot of these examples have a y-intercept of zero because they have x to some power as a factor. We'll try and do some that don't have that. But here the y-intercept is going to be zero. So if we set x equal to zero, y is going to equal, I mean, you could do the work. You could say it's zero times two times negative four squared. But once you say zero times, you should stop. Zero times anything is zero. The x-intercepts are a bit more work. We're going to set the whole thing equal to zero. So zero equals x times x plus two times x minus four squared. I usually kind of like to just look at this and see. So you could write x equal to zero. There's really no more work to do there. Let me ask you guys, what's the multiplicity of this? Is it, well, what's the power here that I didn't write? One. So the multiplicity here is one which is odd, which means we're going to cross. For x plus 2, you can set x plus 2 equal to 0. You're also welcome to skip that step if, it's, if you don't need to write it, and you'll say x equals negative 2. The multiplicity there is also 1. So we're going to cross. And then finally, for x minus 4, equal to zero. I'm just setting the inside part equal to zero. I'm going to get x equal to four. The multiplicity here is two, which is even, which means we're going to bounce. I just like saying the word bounce. Fun to say. I'm going to skip the number line, although I can do it if you want in a minute. So let's just draw the graph. I'm going to put my x-intercepts on there. Zero, negative two, and positive four. Looking beyond the, the, the furthest to the right and the furthest to the left. Intercept. I know after this, it's got to be going up. So it's got to be something like that. And after this, it's got to be going up like that as well, right? In between, wacky stuff can happen. But way to the left, it's up because of the behavior, and way to the right, it's up. So it's not going to look exactly like that. But. So I'm going to come down, and at negative 2, I'm going to cross. So I'm going to cross at negative 2. But then I have to turn around so I can get to my next x-intercept. At zero, we are also crossing. And then I have to turn around at some point so I can hit this. And here I know I'm going to bounce. So I want to kind of, I don't want to bounce too sharply. What I'm saying is that you don't want to do this. It shouldn't be pointy. Um, the nice thing about polynomials is they're actually always smooth. The more 
mathematical word for that is um, they're differentiable. But for now, let's just say smooth. So it's going to do something like that. So yeah, if you have bouncy points, it should always bounce in a smooth way, meaning you shouldn't come at it sharply. You should come at it so that it, it kind of gradually tapers off, right? And then goes back up there. My end behavior looks good, right? I'm up to the left, I'm up to the right. That's kind of it when it comes to graphing polynomials. We find the x-intercepts, we classify them as bouncing or crossing, we find the end behavior, and then we just throw it all on the graph. One thing you do not have to concern yourself with is where to turn around. So maybe you drew yours like this, and maybe I drew mine like this, because I felt like being crazy about it. It's fine. We don't know how extreme this is, so just kind of wing it, really is the answer. Um, when you take calculus, we will learn how to find these local extreme values, right? This, this point here, we will learn how to find out actually how high it goes, and right here, actually how low it goes, wherever that is. I don't actually know where that's occurring. Like It could be at negative one, but it could be somewhere else between negative two and zero. Same deal here. This might be happening at two, but it could be happening at one or three or some irrational number in between them. Um, but yeah, the real name of the game here is don't worry about where to turn around. Just know that if you're going from one x-intercept to the next intercept, you're going to have to go either up or down, but then you'll have to turn around to get back to the next x-intercept. Let's look at the next one here. Sound like that. Okay. Yeah. Move with a little bit of haste so that we can also talk about even and odd stuff. Because the even and odd stuff is important. It does come up on some thing. I said that we don't get it today, we can get it tomorrow, but I'm gonna get it today. So let's graph f of x equal to x cubed minus 5x squared. Notice that this one is not factored for us. So to find the end behavior, well, the degree is three. The leading coefficient is positive. So we know that's going to be down on the left, up on the right. But they have to go opposite directions. And since it's a positive leading coefficient, it's got to be up on the right. It can't be down on the left. Um, our y-intercept, once again, is zero. All right, if we set x equal to zero, we get y equal to f of zero, which is zero cubed minus five times zero squared, which is zero. For the x-intercept, we would prefer this to be factored. For the x-intercept, we're going to take x cubed minus five x squared, set it equal to zero, but then we're going to factor out an x squared. So we x squared times x minus five equal to zero, and then we're going to set each part equal to zero. Setting this equal to zero gives me x equal to zero, Setting this equal to zero gives me x equal to five. So you can write out x minus five equals zero and then add five to both sides to get x equal to positive five. This is gonna be x minus five equal to zero. This is gonna be a multiplicity of one, meaning we're gonna cross because it's an odd multiplicity. x equal to zero came from x squared. That's a multiplicity of two, meaning we're gonna bounce. And I think that's everything. So let's see, we've got zero, five. I'm not gonna try and be super specific and make a whole bunch of little marks so we don't have to. And then we know we're starting down on the left. So somewhere down in quadrant three, we're gonna do some stuff and then we're gonna be up on the right. So down over here, up over here. At zero, we're gonna bounce. So again, if I'm gonna bounce, right, I'm trying to come at this and kind of flatten out as I get there and then come away from it. So I'm going to do that, right? So we bounce off nicely. And then we have to turn around and go through that point there. And I didn't quite get to the arrow, but that's fine. This is just kind of a guide telling me where I need to end up. There you go, that's it. There's not much more to it. Okay, I've got one more graphing example. Yeah, we've got enough time. I was gonna do, let me, I'm gonna change up my last example because I wanna do one where you don't have 
uh, where your y-intercept is not zero for once. So let's look at, so I'm going to change this next one just slightly. I'm going to make it f of x equal to, the one that on in the notes is x cubed times x minus 1 times x minus 3 squared. I'm going to make it x plus 1 cubed times x minus 1 times x plus 3 squared. I'm sorry, x minus 3 squared. It doesn't really matter, but. Okay. So, leaving coefficient and degree. I guess it is a bit out of order. Sorry. So, the degree, let's see. So, I have an x to the third times an x to the first times an x squared. So, x cubed times x to the first times x squared. 3 plus 1 plus 2 is going to be 6. So, my degree is 6. You don't want to multiply this out. Now you can see it here. So let me let me show you the multiplying out that I'm not really doing. I know that if I multiply x plus one cubed, I get x cubed plus lesser terms. X minus one is x minus one. And x minus three squared is x squared minus six x plus nine. And then the x cubed times the x times the x squared gives me x to the sixth. So we're not really multiplying out, we're just thinking about what would happen if we did. The leading coefficient is positive. If you don't see any minus x's anywhere, your leading coefficient is always going to be positive. This is going to lead us to an up on the left, up on the right situation. My y-intercept is not going to be 0. So we're going to plug in x equal to 0. f of 0 is going to be so 0 plus 1 cubed, so 1 cubed, 0 minus 1 and then zero minus three squared. So I'm gonna get one times negative one and negative three squared is positive nine. So one times negative one times nine is negative nine. My y-intercept is zero, negative nine. My x-intercepts, so I'm just setting the whole thing equal to zero, x plus one cubed times x minus one times x minus three squared. This is a little bit less kind of looking. So I think that equal to zero. From x plus one cubed, we get x equal to negative one, because negative one plus one is zero. That's going to have a multiplicity of three. So we're going to cross. x minus one is going to give me an x intercept of x equal to one, because one minus one is zero. A multiplicity of one, we're also going to cross. And finally, x equal to positive three. 3 minus 3 is 0. We have a multiplicity of 2, which means we're going to bounce. So let's see, I've got negative 1, 1, and 3. So those are my x intercepts. And then I've got a y intercept of negative 9, which I'm not going to graph just yet. I'm just going to fill it in after I've done the graph. Uh, so now I'm up on the left, I'm up on the right. So I'm going to start up on the left. Negative one, I'm going to cross. And then positive one, I'm also going to cross. And then positive three, I'm going to bounce. It's not the best graph I've ever drawn. That's OK. This point here where I'm crossing the y-axis needs to do my y-intercept. So that point there is going to be 0, negative 9. Yes, I know my graph is not to scale. If you want to make it scale, you can try to make it. It's hard to make it super exaggerated in the y direction if you've got these very close to the uh, origin x-intercepts. It's OK if it's not to scale. So yeah, that's our graph. OK. So graphing polynomials, this is kind of the recipe. You find the degree, you find the leading coefficient, so you can find the end behavior. Find the y-intercept, find the x-intercepts and their multiplicities to determine if it bounces or crosses there, and then graph the thing. I would encourage you all to do all of that and graph the thing. And then if you're not sure about your graph, check it out on Desmos and see if it looks like it's supposed to look. It doesn't have to look exactly right. It just has to have the right shape and direction. But if yours, if yours is like way more vertically extreme than the actual graph is, that's perfectly fine. Or if it's not vertically extreme enough, that's also fine. Um, let's talk about even and odd. So even function. 
So an even function has symmetry about the y-axis. Meaning, if you flip it around the y-axis and it looks the same, it's even. Analytically, that means f of negative x, right? If you're flipping it around the y-axis, that's when you do the negative on the inside, should look the same as the original function. Here's an example. f of x equal to x squared. Graphically, you can see the symmetry. Right, if you flip this horizontally across the y-axis, it doesn't look any different. That's the very definition of having even symmetry. But if you didn't want to graph it, you don't have to. In fact, we usually don't want to graph it. You can check to see if it's symmetric by saying, well, okay, what's f of negative x? Well, I'm going to take my f of x equal to x squared and I'm going to substitute in negative x for x. So it's going to be negative x squared. The negative x squared is negative x times negative x. And a negative times a negative is a positive. But that is equal to the original function. So look, we have that f of negative x is equal to f of x. I want to stress here, you can't just pick a point and say it works at one point. So if you say that this function is even because f of negative 3 is equal to negative 3 squared, which is 9, and f of 3 is equal to 3 squared, which is 9, that is some evidence that what we think is true is true, but it's not a proof. It's not a justification. To actually to demonstrate that a function is even, you have to show that f of negative x for any x, meaning we have to just leave it as negative x. We can't pick an actual number there. We have to show that this ends up equaling this. Let's look at another example. Um, and so what we end up seeing here Actually, right, so let me do the example before I see the thing. So, time. Yeah, I got the time. Uh, this function, what do we got here? g of x equal to 2x to the sixth uh, minus 3x to the fourth plus 1. This function is also even. So, g of negative x, right? And so we could graph this one and see the symmetry, but this is harder to graph. Like I would encourage everyone to graph this on Desmos and see that, oh yeah, if you were to flip it around the y-axis, it would look the same. Or you could also say, if, it, if it's like looking at itself on one side of the y-axis to the other, it looks like a mirror image, right? This side here, like, oh yeah, look over there. I see my mirror image over there, right? That's what's happening here. This is the mirror image of that. This one's harder to graph though, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna say, well, g of negative x is, 2 times negative x to the 6th minus 3 times negative x to the 4th. When you have a negative thing raised to an even power, it becomes positive, right? Negative x to the 6th is negative x to 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 negative x. It's going to be positive, right? Because you've got an even number of negatives multiplied together. This is 2 times x to the 6th minus 3 times x to the 4th plus 1. But that's exactly what we started with. So it's even. That's how we show a function's even. If you look at g, uh, the function evaluated at negative x, if it's still the same as the original, boom, you're even. How about being odd? So odd. Um, so odd functions have also have symmetry. It's not symmetry about the x-axis though, because that would not be a function that would fail the vertical line test. Odd functions have symmetry about the origin. Also known as rotational symmetry. The kind of prime example of this is f of x equal to x cubed. Again, you all know I'm not good at drawing. It looks like this. And the idea here is that instead of reflecting, well, actually you can, so you can think of it one of two ways. You can either say it's got odd symmetry if 
you rotate it 180 degrees around the origin if it looks the same. That is true here. If you rotate this 180 degrees around the origin, it looks the same. You can also say it's got odd symmetry if reflecting it in the x-axis results in the same as reflecting it in the y-axis. So if I reflect this in the y-axis, it looks the same as I reflect it in the x-axis, which is actually how we test for it. So the way to test for it is to see if f of negative x, the reflection in the y-axis, equals negative f of x, the reflection in the x-axis. So a couple of examples. So to show that f of x equals x cubed is odd, without using a graph, we would say, okay, well, f of negative x is negative x quantity cubed. And when you have a negative thing to an odd power, it ends up staying negative. You can also write it out, although you don't have to. Right, it's negative x times negative x times negative x, which is negative x cubed. Some people like me at this point like to say, well, look, that's just equal. Let me do it in a different color, actually. That's just equal to negative f of x. Other people, and this is also fine, prefer to say, OK, I have that f of negative x is equal to negative x cubed. And then I also have that negative f of x is negative x cubed, which is same thing. So if these are the same, it's odd. I don't care which way you do it. I, I yeah, either way is fine. Let me, I feel like that example, so I'm going to change the next example. Because, well, I'll do both of them. So let's do a couple more. So what about this function? Let's show that f of x equal to 2x to the fifth minus mm, 6x is odd. So I'm going to start with f of negative x. So f of negative x is 2 times negative x to the fifth minus 6 times negative x, which is equal to, so again, negative things to odd powers are going to be negative. So 2 times negative x to the fifth is negative 2x to the fifth. And negative 6 times negative x is positive 6x. So here you could either then say, negative f of x is negative 2x to the fifth minus 6x, which is negative 2x to the fifth plus 6x. And see that those are the same. Or you could factor out a minus sign from here and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah look, that is negative f of x. Either way you want to get there is fine. If you want to if you want to actually show that this becomes negative f of x, that's totally cool. If you would prefer to say, well, f of negative x is this, and negative f of x is also the same thing, that is also totally cool. I usually do it this way because it feels like less writing. Okay. Um, so the way this usually ends up boiling, uh, playing out is usually the way we ask the question is, Tell me if this function is even or odd or neither. So it has to be one of the three. It's either even, meaning f of negative x is equal to f of x, or it's not. If it's not, then it might be odd, meaning f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. But if it's not either one of those, then it's neither. So let's look at an example. Um, let's look at f of x equal to 2x to the fifth plus 3x squared plus 1. Also, you might have noticed that all of the polynomials where all the powers were odd were odd functions. The polynomials where all the powers were even were even functions. This polynomial where we have an odd power and an even power, going to be neither. But let's check. f of negative x is 2 times negative x. I guess I'm, I guess I'm asking the question, is it even? Um, 2 times negative x to the fifth plus three times negative x squared plus one, end up with negative two x to the fifth plus three times positive x squared plus one. Is this equal to f of x? No. 
Definitely not, right? This and this are not the same. No, so it's not even. This is why I like to do the odd part the way I like to do it because then at this point I can just say, well, I can, I mean, I guess I could say, if I'm gonna check for odd, well, I could look at negative f of x. Negative f of x is negative two x to the fifth minus three x squared. I'm just making everything the opposite sign plus one. Is that equal to f of negative x? Is this the same as this? No. So it's not odd. So once it's not odd and not even, we get to say it's neither odd or even. f of x is neither. Um, and we are out of time, so I will stop there. But tomorrow in class, I'll probably start with an odd or another couple of examples of this just so we can see a couple more. Um, but yeah, that's all I've got for today. I will see you all tomorrow. And yeah, that's all I got. James, I have a quick clarification question. Go right ahead. Um, so when it has both, the even and odd, this could be neither, no matter what. So, 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 so I'm not saying the function cannot be both. Okay, yeah. It's not both, right? It's not even and it's not odd, so it's neither. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, actually, I should, I should clarify. There is one function that is both even and odd. It is dumb. It is f of x equal to zero. So this function is in fact both even and odd because f of negative x is also equal to zero which is equal to f of x. And f of negative x is equal to zero, which is equal to negative f of x. But that's the only exception. Every other function is either even or odd or neither. And you can't